even when I was like 15 or 16, you know, I could see myself standing on the stage and, you know, singing songs, you know, so I've been very lucky. Once again, the Eagles made headlines on a global scale as the tragic passing of Glenn Fry sent shockwaves through the music world. They're one of the best-selling bands of all time. Formed in Los Angeles in 1971, the Eagles went on to sell over 150 million albums. The Eagles were and are one of the biggest acts that pop music's ever gonna see. That Greatest Hits album selling over 50 million copies is a real statement. It's a planted thriller in the all-time most popular LP charts. It's a huge, huge success. With five number one singles, six Grammy Awards, five American Music Awards, and six number one albums. The Californian Quartet were one of the most successful acts of the 1970s. They didn't want to just be a hip band or, or a yeah, country rock band. They wanted to be the ultimate LA band. Their album, Hotel California, was ranked among the 20 best-selling albums in the US. Hotel California, it's one of the sort of defining pop culture phenomena of, of the 1970s. The Eagles disbanded in 1980, but reunited in 1994 for the live album, Hell Freezes Over. There was always something standing in our way, challenging us to, to, you know, to overcome it, to, to, to get beyond it. And in 2007, they released Long Road Out of Eden, their first full studio album in 28 years. From performing small gigs in LA to selling out arenas all over the world, their journey has been nothing but fascinating. They uh, did what they set out to do in spades, and they defined their era, they defined their generation. Follow us as we look back on how one of the most successful rock bands created a legacy of timeless music and award-winning sounds that defined a generation. Music is supposed to be fun, that's why they call it playing music. And no matter what level you're at, you know, and obviously I've been very, I'm very lucky, I'm in a band that's, you know, reached a, you know, a, plat a high plateau. But I also have friends that play music that are just as excited and have just as much fun playing in a small club in San Diego or, you know, or, you know, playing at a state fair or, you know, private parties or anything, you know, it's supposed to be fun. And, and you don't, you know, it's kind of like skiing, you know, you don't have to be going down the black diamond runs making a million difficult turns to get the joy, you know, you can be on just a regular slope and get the wind in your hair, you know, and you feel the movement and the flight and, and the sensation. And I think that's, I think that's what you know music can be so some people play to you know uh, a certain level but it's supposed to be fun The death of Glenn Fry is a pretty big deal in the United States, pretty big deal in the music world at large. The Eagles sound has really gone into the DNA of the United States so far and so heavily on a, on a musical level, it's not true. They summed up a lot of America and Americana and now have gotten so big, musically speaking, that they've defined Americana and a lot of American music. The death of Glenn Fry may not stop the Eagles cold in their tracks, but it's really put a damper on, if not the final chapter of their great book. It's, uh, it's huge. The death of Glenn Fry. I hope it doesn't stop the Eagles, but it, but it might. He is a founder member and one of the two geniuses guiding lights of the band. I went to interview Frey and Henley in 1975, I think it was, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I think by that time, the, the Eagles were a little bit wary of journalists. Uh, I, I think they'd suffered some 
some criticism in the music press that their music was on the bland side. But of course, this didn't stop them being enormously successful, unlike a few groups of the time who were enormously successful but whose music didn't necessarily mesh with, with rock critics. Those musicians tended to be a little bit on the defensive side. So when I got there, I was expecting this, but I think I warmed, I think they warmed to me and, uh, and I warmed to them. And so the interview, uh, it was quite long. I think I talked to them for an hour, an hour and a half, and uh, turned out I could write a good uh, five, 6,000 word piece for Melody Maker afterwards. So yeah, it was a good interview and uh, I, I got on fairly well with them. I wasn't one of those journalists who had criticized them. Whilst I have to say I wasn't the, the biggest fan because I, my, my uh, taste in music tends to be a bit heavier than the Eagles, I could appreciate what they were doing and uh, they were doing it very well indeed, which is why they were so successful. Everything that I thought was interesting was happening on the West Coast. That seemed to be the promised land. You know, the, it was warmer <laughs> for starters, but that's where the Beach Boys and the Birds and the Buffalo Springfield and all these other interesting bands were in the mid 60s. So I always wanted to go to California. The group originally sprouted from LA's country rock scene. Well, there certainly was a lot of serendipity involved in the beginning of the Eagles, and uh, you know, it was very, it was interesting that the night that I got hired to join Linda's band, and I was sitting here at the bar at the Troubadour, John Boylan was there, and walking up over on the other side came Don Henley to introduce himself, to say hi to John, and say that he had sent a, a song to right, you sent you yes. sent a song to John for Linda, so. That's just, that just happened one night at the Troubadour Bar. And then, you know, the fact that Don and I got to play in her band and we were roommates together, you know, that just sort of start, you know, we started talking about our dreams and what we wanted to do. And, and you know, so, you know, we were very lucky. And then of course, as, as I said, when we told Linda <coughs> that, you know, we really wanted to have our own band, then she helped us get the guys. She's the one that said you should get Bernie Ludden. So we brought him out to Disneyland for some shows we were doing on graduation nights. And Bernie sat in with us and we got to meet him over the course of a week or so and talk with him. A couple weeks later, we replaced the bass player for a weekend up in uh, Los Altos with Randy Meisner so that he'd come up and play with Linda and we could talk with him as well. So, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was really important. The four original Eagles, Don Henley, Glenn Fry, Randy Meisner, and Bernie Leiden were already experienced professionals when they were assembled as Linda Ronstadt's backup band. Leiden had played in the Flying Burrito Brothers, Meisner with Poco and Rick Nielsen's Stone Canyon Band. Don Henley had been with a transplanted Texas group, Shiloh, and Glenn Fry had played with various Detroit rock bands. I played in the only surf band in Michigan. Everybody else in Michigan, they wanted to be either like the Stone, most of the bands were like the Stones. They had one guy who stood in front and sang and everybody played their instrument to whatever abilities they had. But I was in this band with these guys from Birmingham that sang harmony parts and they did Beach Boys songs and they did Beatles songs and they did you know, other songs with harmony. So I started singing with other people right away and I really liked that. After the quartet toured together in 1971 as part of Linda Ronstadt's band, they went off on their own and were honing the repertoire of songs that would appear on their debut album, Eagles. Their debut album kicked off with the rousing country rocker, Take It Easy. Take It Easy was the first single the Eagles released. It was from their debut album, self-titled The Eagles. It was recorded in London and produced by Glyn Johns. It's included on all their live albums and their best of collections. It's listed as one of the 500 tracks in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that have shaped music. The massive audience at California Jam witnessed the band playing the song live with Glenn Fry on lead vocals with their trademark casual jeans and t-shirts and long hair. Take it easy, take it easy. Don't let the sound of your own wheels drive you crazy. Just find a place. 
Their debut album also contained classic hits such as Peaceful Easy Feeling and Witchy Woman. At this point, their country-flavored rock evoked landscapes as boundless as those of the Old West, whose frontier mythology they adopted. I don't think anyone expected the Eagles to be a huge commercial success. Early 1972, you know, the mainstream is starting to accommodate this soft rock denim, slightly country-ish, acoustic California sound. The Eagles' debut, I think, took a lot of people by surprise in the United States of America. And I'll tell you why. As someone who was a big pop music fan at the time, what happened was you had a lot of bands who had done something in the country rock genre. No one had codified it, no one had defined it as the Eagles were to do. In fact, these people had more or less failed. There had been the odd single on the rock and roll forward slash pop charts that had a country rock feel to it. But none of the great bands that we talk about now, witness the Flying Burrito Brothers with Graham Parsons for a great example, none of them really sold any records to speak of. No hits. The Eagles came in and that first album really took a lot of people by surprise. It had three American top 10 smasheroos. That's something, you know, when you start about Witchy Woman and, and Take It Easy, those are big hit singles in the United States. They're on classic radio now. Somewhere now in the United States, you can hear those songs by turning the dial. It was sort of the perfect record at that moment. It almost seemed to soundtrack that idea of Southern California in the early 70s. The social milieu of Southern California inspired the central metaphor of the Eagles' second album, Desperado a concept album in which the band explored themes of the Old West, drawing comparisons between their lifestyle and modern rock stars. But by ditching the sound the band had established with their debut album, and by venturing down a new musical route, were the Eagles taking a risk? I think the Eagles were taking a risk with this idea of a concept album, Desperado. This idea of uh, an album about outlaws, cowboys, Whatever faults, pluses, and minuses the Eagles had, very, very few acts on their second album, album number two, decide, let's do a concept record. Let's throw our success of three hit singles off the first album just out the window. Let's forget about that. Let's do a concept album on our second album. And it's a perfectly acceptable, understandable concept now. It's a kind of a cliche now. In the, in the 21st century, but when the Eagles did, it's like, huh? It was completely new, no one had ever done it. And it's a very ballsy, ballsy step. Songs like Desperado helped define the band, yes, it's true. But stuff like Outlaw Man and Duel and Dalton, those, those aren't chart singles, but they help the story flow along on the Desperado album. And I think it's a, it's a terrific record in and of itself. It's not like anything else really in their back catalog and it sort of pretty much stands alone as far as I can see in the, in the world of rock and roll, period. The album was less successful than the group's debut release, reaching only number 41 on the US Billboard 200 and yielding two singles. Did the very fact that it was a concept album mean that it wasn't a commercial success? I mean, probably not, but it, it just so happens that it, it, it wasn't, it didn't work. I mean, you know, it's interesting, uh, Atlantic Records, which distributed Asylum, the label that the Eagles were on, when they first heard Desperado, they were assuming they were going to get a record that was going to, you know, uh, follow up on the commercial success of, of Take It Easy, Witchy Woman, etc. And, and they heard it and they went, they made a fucking cowboy record. <laughs> they were really pissed off. I mean, ultimately, it did count against them. It, it, it was a disappointing record for them. You know, it, 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 it didn't follow up on the, on the success of the first album. It was during recording sessions for Desperado that Don Henley and Glenn Fry first began writing together. They co-wrote eight of the album's 11 songs, including Tequila Sunrise and Desperado. 
two of the group's most popular songs, with Henley and Fry co-writing the bulk of the album, a pattern that would continue for years to come. The album marked a significant change for the band in terms of leadership and creative control. When the band started out, when they're playing with Linda Ronstadt and the Corvettes, the Long Branch, Penny Whistle and all that, when they incubated, it was all for one and one for all, like the Four Musketeers. And as things went along, we now know that, that Glenn and Don had a chat after rehearsal and said, if this band's really gonna go, you and I have to drive the car. Not to sound like the other two guys at all, but to, to really focus here, you and I have to push things forward. They, if you like, were the Lennon McCartney of the group, the, the Jagger Richards of the group. And it may well be that the other two, Meisner and, and Bernie Leiden, were a bit miffed about this. You know, after all, those two had got a better pedigree, if, if you like. Meisner had come from playing with Rick Nelson's Stone Canyon Band, and Bernie Leiden was in Poco, of course. So those two had actually, you know, been around the block more than, more than, than Frey and Henley. With Desperado, you know, and particularly that song, something kind of happened between Glenn and Don. You know, that they, they just started to sort of gravitate towards each other and, and kind of got off on each other, realized that, that they were sort of soulmates in a sense and that they enjoyed writing together. Whereas Bernie Ledden and Randy Meisner were just different from them. They were sort of, they weren't like budding rock stars, which Glenn Fry obviously was just born to be a rock star. Don Henley was a slightly less obvious rock star, but nonetheless, these were the alpha males within the group. Just pure luck, as I say, that their voices blended the way they did. It's just fortuitous, luck, fortune, fate, that their writing styles blended as well as they did. When you start coming up with material like Desperado, you're really onto something. And I think you see a bit of the Lennon McCartney or uh, Mick Jones and Joe Strummer of the Clash or Jagger and Richards, you see sparks starting to fly from Henley and Fry back and forth. And when you have those sparks and get into that sort of friendly rivalry thing, that's what pushes the band forward into the Super League. Glenn and Dawn, they aspired to a level of success that, that maybe only Linda Ronstadt, who was a friend of theirs and who they'd played with had had, had enjoyed, or could sort of see that, that, that you could do something with country rock which could, which could actually take you into the top 40. So they started taking the songwriting really seriously and they realized they could write together and they really paid attention to, you know, phrasing, lyrics, riffs, chord changes, and they became the dominant songwriting kind of nucleus within the band. For their next album, On the Border, Henley and Fry wanted the band to break away from the country rock style and move more towards hard rock. The Eagles initially started with Glenn Johns as the producer for this album, but he tended to emphasize the lush side of their double-edged music. After completing only two songs, the band turned to Bill Simchik to produce the rest of the album. I think there'd always been sort of tensions between the band and, and Glenn. Glenn is, you know, as, has as big an ego as any of the acts he's worked with. And, you know, he's kind of the boss. And he, he and Glenn Fry had always sort of bumped heads a little bit. Simchek wanted a harder-edged guitarist for the song Good Day in Hell, and the band remembered Bernie Leiden's childhood friend, Don Felder. In January 1974, Frey called Felder to add slide guitar to the song, and the band were so impressed that they invited him to join the group as the fifth member of the band. That was sort of the game plan. Let's, let's toughen up the band's sound. Let's make them more of a kind of kick-ass rock and roll band. So in comes Don Felder, and suddenly you've got You've got a sound that's just that's got some balls, it's got some attack, and, and that's there from the get-go. The very first track, already gone, signals, this is a new band. And Glenn Fry said of it himself that that was the sound of me kind of being liberated, if you say. The shackles were off, and this was, this was his Eagles. I'm a rock star, I come from Detroit. This is the band as like a gang, and we're gonna, you know, we're not, and no one's going to pretend that we're Led Zeppelin or anything, but, 
But we're gonna we're gonna prove that, that yeah we can rock. On the border yielded a number one Billboard single, "Best of My Love," which hit the top of the charts on March 1st, 1975. The song was the Eagles' first of five chart toppers, showcasing the harder edge of the band's new sound with the addition of Felder. Already Gone was also successful, reaching number 32 on the charts. On the Border is almost as crazy an out there decision as Desperado. Look at the Eagles' back catalog. The first two are sort of of a pair, country rock. The third album, On the Border, they shift to a hard rock sound. What for? You were doing okay before. As they move forward in the band, the Eagles are doing very, very different things. Normally, as I've said before, people stick with one thing and repeat it ad infinitum. A lot of rock's greatest bands repeated what they did ad infinitum and had great success. Look at the influence of a band like the Ramones. Look at the great sales success of a band like Creedence Clearwater Revival, mainly doing the same thing over and over again, although in a wonderful way, they had extensions, they had refinements. The Eagles did different things. And on this third album, On the Border, shifting to a hard rock sound, it not only was successful and brought them back with a lot of uh, hits, you have to give them artistic credit for having the huevos to want to do such a thing. On the Border, the title track is a, is a really new kind of sound for them. It's almost funky. I think it's one of their greatest tracks. Don Henley is coming more to the fore, you know, on the back of Desperado, which is with his great solo vo vocal kind of showcase. You hear his voice on On the Border. I mean, he's he's starting to become more of a that that voice becomes a, a really defining signature sound for the Eagles. The Eagles released their fourth studio album, One of These Nights, on June 10, 1975. A breakthrough album for the Eagles, making them international superstars. It was the first in a string of four consecutive number one albums. Irving Azoff was really starting to position them as, you know, a band that could to a big arenas. So he was certainly encouraging them to write hits. And part of that was, you know, was really breaking out of the confines of, you know, of country rock. And I think, you know, the title track of, of one of these nights is a very good example of that. It's very far from country rock. It's it's super slick. It's influenced, if anything, by like Philadelphia Soul, which they were big fans of. I mean, you have to remember that Henley and Fry were both big fans of R&B and soul music, and they weren't just listening to sort of, you know, Graham Parsons and country music. They were listening to Al Green. They were listening to Har Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, you know. So on one of these nights was, was a great piece of commercial blue-eyed soul you, you you would say it's commercial it's very commercial on that album one of these nights the eagles i think realized something when you play 4-4 rock and roll funny enough you only get the 4-4 rock and roll crowd should you do as well as you can with that sound that's all you get to not just push the boat out further but to have a wider and broader palette to paint from, you've got to do other things. So you have different time signatures, you have a slightly slicker sound, the drums get turned up, there's a more emphasis on the offbeat, the hi-hat's a little louder, and all of a sudden, your contemporary, with not just your rock and roll predecessors and equals and contemporaries, you're now uh, in the charts against Philadelphia international artists, you're now competing with the big boys, everybody. The world is your oyster. There's nothing holding you back. Had the Eagles stayed with the hard rock sound or of uh, On the Border or the country rock sound of the first two albums, they would have been in a niche. They would have been in a huge niche, a financially lucrative niche, but they'd been in a niche. Once you expand your palette to not just be the two and the four, but the one and the three beat, and to get that sort of fa disco, uptown slick New York sound into your own vocals and, and songwriting abilities, there's nothing on the charts that's alien to you. You appeal to an urban African-American audience that never would have touched you before. You appeal to all sorts of college kids that just want to get on the dance floor and boogie. They don't want to rock out and nod their heads. They want to get on the dance floor and shake it. So they expanded their market wildly with the wonderfully successful album One of These Nights, no question. The dominant songwriting partnership of Henley and Fry continued on this album. The first single was the title track, which became their second consecutive chart topper. 
The second single was Lion Eyes, which reached number two on the charts and won the band their first Grammy Award. Lion Eyes is the hit record that Graham Parsons should have had if he had, if he had been commercially minded, he could have written that. But it's like Henley and Fry took the Graham Parsons Flying Burrito Brothers thing and really streamlined it into something, well, top 40, really commercial. The final single was Take It to the Limit, written by Meisner, Henley and Fry, and featuring Meisner on lead vocals. The song reached number four on the charts and was the Eagles' first single to be certified gold. Still you're coming back, you're running back, you're coming back for more. There was a big showcase for, for Randy Meisner who had um, a voice that was similar to Don Henley's, but was a really high tenor voice. And, and Take It to the Limit was his, his big kind of moment on the record and on stage. It really sort of propelled the Eagles into, you know, into the next level of, of stardom, that album. It started to position them as the ultimate LA band. The band launched a huge worldwide tour in support of the album. One of these nights was nominated for a Grammy Award for Album of the Year. It was their last album to feature founding member Bernie Leadon, who left the group in December of that year. Leiden was disillusioned with the direction the band's music was taking, as their sound was moving from his preferred country to rock and roll. Leiden penned two songs for the album, including I Wish You Peace, written with girlfriend Patti Davis, and the instrumental Journey of the Sorcerer. Leiden's replacement, officially announced on December 20th, 1975, was guitarist, singer, and keyboardist Joe Walsh, who had been a friend of the band for years. He had previously performed with the James Gang, Barnstorm, and as a solo artist. He was also managed by Azoff and used Simchik as his record producer. There was some initial concern as to Walsh's ability to fit in with the band, as he was considered too wild for the Eagles, especially by Henley. And he was a regular, you know, hard-hitting rock star. And there was a lot of you know, talk, how's he gonna fit in with the Eagles, this guy? You know, because Joe Walsh had a reputation as a bit of a wild guy, and the Eagles certainly, outwardly, had a reputation as being fairly soft focus, easygoing guys who, who, who didn't overdo the decadence. So how would he fit in? Well, in fact, he did fit in really well, which I think surprised a lot of people. After the departure of Leiden, the Eagles' early country sound almost completely disappeared, with the band employing a harder sound with the addition of Felder and Walsh. In early 1976, the band released their first compilation album, their greatest hits, 1971 to 1975. The album became the highest selling album in US history, with more than 29 million copies sold in the US alone, and more than 42 million copies worldwide. The album cemented the group's status as the most successful American band of the decade. And people, I think, who'd maybe like the odd song, but not this song, suddenly they all bought that, and then the Eagles just exploded in terms of their live attraction. They, they, they were doing arena tours alongside the Fleetwood Macs of this world, and they were, they were getting up there with, with, not, with, the, with the Led Zepps and the, and the Who's who were, who were playing the, the baseball arenas and, uh, and, the, and the basketball stadiums in America, you know, 20,000 people a night. And this is what, it was one of these nights that took them to that level, and they'd stay at that level for the rest of their career. Some people were scathing about them and saw this as very, you know, saw the Eagles as quite sort of antiseptic, as a bit of a kind of sellout. You know, anyone who'd ever loved Graham Parsons, you know, for them, the Eagles were just, were, were too slick. You know, it was too produced, it was too perfect. Neil Young, interestingly, said you know, he really liked the Eagles because they were, they were the, the sound of LA now. That, that was, they were really representing what Los Angeles had become. And Los Angeles, by the, by the mid 70s, had become a very slick place. They really were becoming the sort of dominant California stars of the era. And by, you know, by 75, 76, the Eagles were, 
you know, we're, we're, we're almost like the biggest band in America. Released on December 8th, 1976, Hotel California was the band's fifth studio album and the first to feature Walsh. The album took a year and a half to complete, a process which along with touring drained the band. The album's first single, New Kid in Town, became the Eagles' third number one single. Johnny come lately, the new kid in town. Everybody loves you, so don't let them down. And then New Kid in Town is also a song about being a successful artist and there's a threat now, there's a new kid in town, there's new people coming into LA, are they going to usurp us, are they going to take our place? And there was a big threat, particularly in the form of Bruce Springsteen, who came to play LA in 1975, he played the Roxy and set the town on fire. And suddenly the Eagles act, which someone once characterized as loitering on stage, suddenly it was like this guy comes in from New Jersey and he's leaping around and he's got this amazing sax player and it's all really vibrant and exciting and it's like Springsteen spelled the death of, of like the laid back denim singer songwriters you know he was like like a burst of, of kind of energy that the scene needed so New Kid in Town was partly about Springsteen Johnny come lately the new kid in town she still love you when you're not The second single was the title track, which topped the charts in May 1977 and became the Eagles' signature song. It features Henley on lead vocals with a guitar duet performed by Felder and Walsh. The song was written by Felder, Henley, and Fry, with Felder writing all the music. Look at something like the title track of Hotel California. It's got a whole reggae thing going to it with some sort of Southwestern or Granada or uh, Spanish guitars. Yet the whole thing sounds like the Eagles. They take from other musics and they don't sound like anything but the Eagles. And Hotel California is sort of ground zero of Eagles artistry. It's the one album you'd pull out to define what they did best and how they touched so many hearts. Welcome to the Hotel California. It's about being in Los Angeles in the mid 70s and what that means and what Los Angeles has become, what it's become not just for the for people in LA, but what it's become for the rest of the world. The Eagles represent this sort of fantasy of Southern California life, which is which is all about, you know, it's about denim jeans, it's about mirrored sunglasses, it's about blonde women in convertible cars, you know, on freeways, you know, heading for the ocean. It's one of the sort of defining pop culture phenomena of, of the 1970s. That, that idea of what bands like the Eagles represent, you know. With its hard rock sound, Life in the Fast Lane was also a major success that established Walsh's position in the band. The third and final single from Hotel California, it reached number 11 on the charts. Hotel California has appeared on several lists of the best albums of all time and is the band's best-selling studio album, with more than 16 million copies sold in the U.S. alone and more than 32 million copies worldwide. Hotel California is where those guys are working with and at the peak of their powers. They did great things since, that's not in dispute, but they didn't do anything that's quite going to touch as many hearts and be the right band at the right time as Hotel California. I know this sounds stupid, but in a way it's their Sgt. Pepper. In a way, Hotel California is their pet sounds. The song Victim of Love was a point of contention between Don Felder and the rest of the band. Felder claimed that he had been promised the lead vocal on Victim of Love, for which he had written most of the music. After many unproductive attempts to record Felder's vocal, 
Band manager Irving Azoff was delegated to take Felder out for a meal, removing him from the mix while Don Henley overdubbed his lead vocal. Joe Walsh said that Felder never forgave them for the snub. Hotel California is the last album to feature founding member Randy Meisner, who abruptly left the band after the 1977 tour. The Eagles had been touring continuously for 11 months, and Meisner was suffering from stomach ulcers and the flu by the time they arrived in Knoxville in July. Fry and Meisner had been continually arguing about Meisner's unwillingness to perform his signature song, Take It to the Limit, during the tour, as Meisner was struggling to hit the crucial high notes in the song due to his ailments. During the following show, Meisner decided to skip the song due to his flu, but when Frey aggressively demanded that he sing it as an encore, the two got into a physical confrontation backstage and Meisner left the venue. Despite pleas from Felder and Walsh, Meisner decided to leave the group after the final date of the tour and returned to Nebraska to be with his family. His last performance was in East Troy, Wisconsin on September 3, 1977. The band replaced Meisner with the same musician who had succeeded him in Poco, Timothy B. Schmidt after agreeing that Schmidt was the only candidate. Any warmth that, was, that existed within the group was cooling down now, and that they were harboring possibly solo ambitions as well. So the unity of the Eagles was becoming fragmented. Most rock bands don't last more than, I mean, it's getting shorter and shorter every year, isn't it? I mean, it's like... We had a, you know, we, we had a sort of a, uh, a collective idea of where we wanted to go, but, uh, you know, we were living in the moment, song to song, show to show, record to record. The one thing I, I found interesting, uh, I was surprised at how many obstacles we had to overcome in this short nine-year period from 1971 to 1980. And it included changing producers, changing band members, changing managers, changing business managers, changing agents, changing record companies. There was always something standing in our way, challenging us to, to you know, to overcome it, to, to, to get beyond it. And I think that's what we were caught up in every day, you know, every day, you know, it wasn't like we're going to be along a band that's going to last for a lifetime. It was nothing like that, but, you know, we certainly wanted to be a band that was a good band and a band that was respected by its peers. You know, we wanted to have hit records and peer respect. And um, I think we were able to actually achieve both. It was actually more difficult than we thought to get music, to get work done, because there were so many other issues that came up all the time. You know, the management issues and record label, the things that Glenn spoke about. There were so much, <clears throat> so many business issues that came up and interpersonal band issues that I'm surprised we found time to write any songs at all. Uh, but somehow we got it done, you know, youth, youthful enthusiasm or whatever you want to call it. But uh, there were a great many obstacles, as Glenn said, and we were learning as we went. You know, we, we, we started out knowing very little about the music business and we learned, we, uh, we learned the hard, some lessons the hard way. Uh, although we didn't uh, have as many disasters as some other groups, but we did uh, have some, some difficulties. I think what happened to the Eagles after Hotel California, which was really the sort of you know creative and, and commercial peak for the group, was, was what happens to almost every band that achieves that level of, su of success. They start to become insular, quite cut off from the world they came out of, or quite cut off from the street, from their fans. You know, they, you start to live in this kind of bubble of fame and wealth. The pressure was on after Hotel California. Of course, some of the guys are gonna have writer's block. Of course, some of the guys aren't gonna wanna work. They've been at this for about eight years now, why not take some time off and drive sports cars around the hills in, of Colorado? If the long run had come out and it had been by a band called The Beagles or The Nobodies or Simon Smith and the New Guys You've Never Heard Of, people be, this debut album, The Long Run by Simon Smith and the Guys You've Never Heard Of, it's fabulous! And we'd all be uncorking champagne at their record label. It's only in comparison to Hotel California, which is such a mega success. And I don't feel it should be in the shadow of anything. 
On July 31, 1980, in Long Beach, California, tempers boiled over into what has been described as the long night at Wrong Beach. The animosity between Felder and Fry boiled over before the show began, when Felder said, you're welcome, I guess, to California Senator Alan Cranston's wife as the politician was thanking the band backstage for performing a benefit for his reelection. Fry and Felder spent the entire show telling each other about the beating each planned to administer backstage. It appeared to be the end of the Eagles, but the band still had a commitment with Electra Records to make a live record from the tour. Eagles Live, released in November 1980, was mixed on opposite coasts. Fry had already quit the band and would remain in Los Angeles, while the other band members each worked on their parts in Miami. Fry refused to speak to the other Eagles, and he fired Irving Azoff as his manager. Once you get into the stratosphere, we've witnessed in rock and roll, or pop music in general, or entertainment in general, it's really hard to maintain the same warm, buddy-buddy relationship you had with someone who you're with 340 days of the year, who you're not only riding with and working with, you're living with, certainly on the road, you're doing business deals with, you're probably closer to them and know more about that person than you do your own wife and children. I'm quite serious with this. So, of course, there's gonna be, there's gonna be problems. Stratospheric success does strange things to people, you know, it changes them, it just changes them. And I think Henley and Fry, who, who'd been really, you know, really had been soulmates. They had lived together, they'd shared this, this sort of uh, uh, splendid bachelor pad in, in, in Bel Air. But they started to kind of turn on each other, started to irritate each other, you know, I'm sure that sort of drugs didn't help, but you know, they, they, they fell out of, of, of sort of brotherly love, if you like, and, and, and started to bicker like an old married couple, and, and, and Fry moved out. The friendship really started to sort of fade away and, and it just wasn't a happy camp anymore. When we stopped, I didn't really have a life and I didn't know what to do and I was sad. So I pretended that we didn't stop and I, I kept going. And basically I ended up uh, uh, alcoholic and dependent on substances and those things gradually convince you that you can't do anything without them. And that's how I, I wound up. You know, every band has its own road to follow. Uh, I just know that, you know, when, when things get difficult, it helps to take a deep, couple of deep breaths. After the Eagles broke up, the former members pursued solo careers. Elektra, the band's longtime record label, owned the rights to solo albums created by members of the Eagles. Walsh had established himself as a solo artist in the 1970s, before and during his time with the Eagles. But it was uncharted waters for the others. Walsh released a successful album in 1981, There Goes the Neighborhood, but subsequent albums throughout the 1980s, such as Got Any Gum, were less well received. Fry also achieved solo success in the 1980s. In 1982, he released his first album, No Fun Allowed, which spawned the number 15 hit, The One You Love. 1984's The All Nighter featured the number 20 hit, Sexy Girl. He reached number two on the charts with The Heat Is On from the Beverly Hills Cop soundtrack. He had another number two single in 1985 with You Belong to the City from the Miami Vice soundtrack, which featured another Fry song, Smuggler's Blues. Henley achieved arguably the greatest commercial solo success of any former Eagle. In 1981, he sang a duet with Stevie Nicks of Fleetwood Mac, Leather and Lace. In 1982, he released I Can't Stand Still, featuring the hit Dirty Laundry. This album would pale in comparison to his next release in 1984, Building the Perfect Beast, which features the classic rock radio staples, The Boys of Summer, All She Wants to Do Is Dance, Not Enough Love in the World, and Sunset Grill. Henley's next album, The End of Innocence, released in 1989, was also a major success. It includes The End of Innocence, The Last Worthless Evening, and The Heart of the Matter. An Eagles country tribute album titled Common Thread, The Songs of the Eagles, was released in 1993, 13 years after the breakup. Travis Tritt insisted on having the long-run era Eagles in his video for Take It Easy, and they agreed. 
Following years of public speculation, the band formally reunited the following year. The lineup comprised the five long-run era members, Fry, Henley, Walsh, Felder, and Schmidt. At their first live performance in April 1994, Fry announced, for the record, we never broke up, we just took a 14-year vacation. The ensuing tour spawned a live album titled Hell Freezes Over, named for Henley's recurring statement that the group would get back together when hell freezes over. Two things happened in the early 90s. I got married and I started a family right away. So by, by 1993, I had two small kids. And then the Eagles got back together. We started talking about it in 93. It happened in 94. And once the Eagles got back together, you know, that was, you know, that became the focus of, you know, it was family and the band. So the, really the Glenn Fry yeah, solo yeah, career yeah. wasn't, uh, it wasn't as important, you know. And, and the Eagles was the mothership. You know, we, uh, you the know, last I think it's almost a big, three years, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a big, you know, but, you know, it's, it's been, the Eagles have been very good to all of us and all of us guys in the band understand the value of keeping the band together. Don and Glenn um, came to me uh, in, in 1993 and a half and said, we're thinking about trying it again and we can't really do it without you and we can't do it unless you're sober. And I was hitting bottom right then. Uh, uh, I was really, took it as far as I could go. And uh, that was the reason I had been waiting for all those years. So uh, it was pretty much of a no-brainer. You know, there was a point where we could do pretty much anything we wanted. So we did. Uh, there was... Uh, a period of time there in the early 70s where the, the whole world was different. And uh, I'm not really ashamed of anything. I mean, we, we had an amazing journey and that was part of it. Sorry, I'm hogging the mic, go ahead. No, it's okay. Uh, the thing I'm sure you all know, at that time in history, everybody was behaving. <laughs> Doctors, lawyers, Wall Street types, you know, they were all doing it. It was that, that kind of a time. You know, and I think the lesson to take away from this is that we all survived, we're all alive and well. We, we've been through the fire. You know, a great many people didn't make it, both in the States and here in Britain. We've lost a lot of people in the business. But uh, for one reason or another, through, you know, good genetics or willpower or good fortune or whatever, we're all fine. And uh, we intend to stay that way, and we're grateful for that. You know, you know, most of the the guys up here on this dais, we are we're all very generous people. We're generous with other people, and I need to be a little more generous with myself. And you got to look at yourself, and you have to look at your past, and you have to accept who you are and what you did. Be thankful that no one got hurt. Uh, you know, say you're sorry for the things you did that were wrong, and get on with it. And I feel that, you know, we're, we're pretty comfortable with who we are up here now. And, uh, you know, I, I, for one, you know, it didn't take me long to sort of get over that. Oh, God, I was 28. I looks like I smoked a joint before that interview. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't think about that stuff uh, too much. And I don't think other people should either. You know, I think you should, uh, like I said, you know, everybody should be as generous with themselves as they are with other people. 1998 the Eagles were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. For the induction ceremony, all seven Eagles members, Fry, Henley, Felder, Walsh, Schmidt, Leiden, and Meisner, played together for two songs, Take It Easy and Hotel California. In 2007, the Eagles, consisting of Fry, Henley, Walsh, and Schmidt, released Long Road Out of Eden, their first album of all new material since 1979. The album debuted at number one in the U.S., and it became their third studio album and seventh release overall to be certified at least seven times platinum. You know, we we're, we have a really good working relationship now. I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, with the way things are going in the Eagles since we got back together, and in particular, in particular in the last five or six years. I think, I think getting in the studio and actually making Long Road Out of Eden 
which also took about three years and, and uh, commitment from Don and myself and everybody. Uh, I think that really got us over the hump. And, you know, I think now, we, you know, I'm very comfortable with who they are, the guys that I work with, and I'm pretty comfortable with who I am. And I think we have a, uh, we, don't, we don't really have many disagreements. We have discussions about things, but things don't fester anymore. And we were younger, you know, we didn't perhaps handle some of the pressures of, uh, you know, what was going on as, as well as we perhaps could have. But in this second incarnation of the band, it's pretty smooth sailing. When Long Road Out of Eden came out, the thing about it that I liked the most was they didn't approach it. Okay, some of the old country rock sound was there and it was very successful in the way they did it. But the marketing of it was, was really savvy. As the record industry began to decline around the millennium, a lot of people were caught napping and the Eagles did a very, very wise thing. We've got a new studio album coming out. We don't want to be a heritage band. We don't want to just be played on oldies radio. We want to be a, 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 a living, breathing organism again. And they put that album in heavy marketing in non-rock and roll places. With the decline of the record store, where can we sell hard copies of this album? They were in Best Buy, they were in Circuit City, they were in Walmart. Those shops had either very, very few CDs at the time, or sometimes they didn't have any CDs. But middle America goes into those stores. And the Eagles thought, how can we touch that market? And by going into the shops that I've just named, they nailed it. They had displays right where middle America goes. They had this appeal, they had this iconic American image of the Southwest, and you think the Eagles, you think of the American Southwest, you just do. I don't know why, you think of mesas and plains and deserts and flatlands and cacti, you just do. And that was the image they had in these shops. And they completely, as they did in the old days, they completely somehow caught the zeitgeist, just nailed it and tapped right into where they should have been at the time. And they had a very popular album out of it, which saved them the nightmare of, you know, they're playing their old hits, great, and then you go, we're gonna do a new song now, and you can see some of the audience just go to the, well, I'll go get a Coke now, or I'll go to the toilets now. The Eagles never had that. With a new successful album of studio tracks, we're gonna do a new song, and everyone would applaud the intro. It's a miracle the way they came back, not just as strongly as they did in terms of six sales and aesthetically, but as wisely as they did in terms of marketing. Whoever thought of all this stuff is a very smart cookie. On January 28, 2008, the second single off Long Road Out of Eden was released. Busy Being Fabulous peaked at number 28 on the U.S. Billboard Hot Country Songs chart. When we're talking about the new video, Busy Being Fabulous, I looked at it and thought, who the hell is this? And you realize that they're singing about what they know, which is what any writer should do. You write about or sing about what you know. And here they are with those very somber suits with black ties and the very sensible white shirts and the, uh, the black suits. And they're singing about what they know, looking completely different. And it's, it's, it was very impressive. I, I lived near Henley in Hollywood, in a, in a much smaller pad, I must say. But I lived uh, just blocks away from it one time in the Hollywood Hills. And I, when I looked at that video of Busy being fabulous, I thought, this is a guy that's writing about something that he lived and that he's sick to death of. And he can do a Randy Newman-esque caricature of it, or piss take, as the English would say, and do it well, because this is the life that I'm sure Henley and Fry et al, I don't know if enjoyed is the word, they might have suffered under all those years in the Hollywood Hills. And I thought it was a, a, a catchy little song. It really caught me by surprise. They've got a sense of humor because there's a monkey in it as well, isn't there? And the monkey's like a cop, and the monkey, I think it's, I think it's, I think I'm right in saying it's Joe Walsh is the doorman at this exclusive club or something, isn't it? Which is typical of Joe Walsh, he always had a good sense of humor. And he's taught the monkey how to nick people's wallets, hasn't he? So the monkey goes in and grabs someone's wallet out of a handbag or something, doesn't it? I thought it was rather funny. So good for the Eagles for doing a, a, an interesting video. Just 
With the tragic passing of Glenn Frey on January 18, 2016, the Eagles lost not only one of their founding members, but a creative genius that was the inspiration behind many of the Eagles' classic hits. The question now remains, will the Eagles produce any new music ever again? I find it unlikely that, the, that we'll ever see you know, the Eagles either touring or making records again. So um, I think Henley would take the view that without Glenn, we don't have the Eagles anymore. And now the question remains, will the Eagles carry on or not? It is difficult, to say the least, to replace a guy like Glenn Fry, who even if people don't know his name, have heard his voice many times and have seen his image many times. It's extremely difficult for rock and rollers to retire. Witness McCartney's still out there. Witness the Rolling Stones are still out there. Witness Van Morrison's still out there. What do you expect people to do? They do what they do best and they do what they love. Most athletes would never retire, but their bodies force them to. Most politicians would remain politicians till they're voted out of office. Why should musicians stop? There are those that would like to, I'm sure, that would like the Eagles to call it a day now that the Mr. Fry is no longer with us. But I think there is an argument for getting one of the original guys, Leden or Meisner, if not both, back on board and doing a valedictory tour one last time around the track. Some people might question why, and my answer to that would be, why not? Something like the Eagles gets to the point where it's just a few notches down from the Beatles. They've been around so long and given so many people so much happiness. What's the problem with that? No other band did as much to translate the explosively creative, politicized rock of the 1960s into the massively popular, depoliticized rock of the 1970s as the Eagles. Specializing in broadly appealing, masterfully crafted tunes, the Southern California band has sold more than 150 million albums. Though most of its members came from outside California, the group was closely identified with a country and folk-tinged sound that initially found favor in Los Angeles during the late 60s. The band also drew upon traditional rock and roll styles and, in its later work, helped define the broadly popular rock sound that became known as classic rock. Their greatest hits in Hotel California rank among the 10 best-selling albums ever, and the popularity of 2007's Long Road Out of Eden proved the Eagles' staying power in the new millennium. The Eagles chronicled America in the high-flying 70s, a time of rapidly changing social mores leading up to what they called life in the fast lane. Between the lines, their favorite subject matter was the pursuit and unraveling of the American dream. No other band is likely to leave such a long-lasting and indelible stamp on the rock and roll scene as the Eagles did. Even if they may never produce any new material, the LA rockers have certainly made a lasting impression with their heartfelt classic sound that will inspire music lovers for generations to come.